Welcome back to our studies in the Minor Prophets. Uh, this is week seven, so maybe a pop quiz. Would that be good on what we've done so far? Uh, I'll, I'll give you, here's, here's the theme. He's the one who, you need to finish that with each of these. So let's start off with a really hard one. How about Jonah? He's the one who, a whale. The, this class is so sharp, I knew that you would be on top of this thing. Well, I won't push that any further, but it, it, it is, my, my confidence in the class has its limits, but it is a good way to remember because these aren't passages that we often go back to for devotional reading. We should more than we do, probably. But uh, to get a handle on each one, Hosea, is the prophet who, whose wife left the family, went into sin, but he brought her back. It's a symbol of redemption. Uh, Joel gave us that wonderful passage that Peter preached from on the day of Pentecost. So in each one of these, there's, some, there's a handle there that we can find to say, oh, I know who that prophet is. At least I know where to start with that prophet. And it's true today too. Our prophet today is Nahum one of the shorter books and one of the lesser known Old Testament books, but it has a powerful message for us because it's inspired by the Lord. It's in the Bible for a reason. Let's, um, let's start with a historical setting and then we'll go to the biblical truth that we find in the book of Nahum. Nahum prophesied six centuries before Christ the Old Testament puts the minor prophets in chronological order, or at least the chronological order that the Jewish rabbis thought was accurate. Not all scholars agree with every placement today. But, but roughly, the minor prophets move from the earliest to the latest in the opinion of those who first put the Old Testament together. And Nahum is right in the middle. So he's among the... Uh, among the minor prophets, he's about at the center of the chronological sequence for those. The world's superpower in his day was Assyria. Assyria controlled virtually all of the Middle East, from the Persian Gulf all the way to Egypt and including Egypt. Uh, historians say that at the time Nahum was writing, Assyria's empire was the largest one the world had ever seen. We aren't the first superpowers in this world. There have been superpowers before us and they haven't always been champions of democracy and of righteousness. Assyria was the world's superpower in Nahum's day and the greatest one that the world had ever seen. When God gave him a message against Assyria, that was front page news. I mentioned that they went all the way into Egypt. Thebes was the capital of Egypt. It was supposed to be the unconquerable city. And Egypt was the major rival of Assyria, but it fell to Assyria. It became a part of that empire. And the key to the fall was the fall of that capital city of Thebes. Nahum knew his history, and that's where his book starts. Here's what he wrote. Are you better than Thebes? Writing to Assyria. Are you better than Thebes, situated on the Nile, with water all around her? The water was her defense. The water's her wall. Cush and Egypt were her boundless strength. Pud and Libya were among her allies, and yet she was taken captive and went into exile. Lots were cast for her nobles, and all her great men were put in chains. Assyria knew this story that Nahum was talking about because they were the ones who had conquered Thebes. I, I imagine an Assyrian reading this would laugh. Nahum says, are you better than Thebes? Well, of course we're better than Thebes. We're the ones that conquered Thebes. We're the ones that brought Egypt down. What do you mean, are you better than Thebes? 
But Nahum has news for Assyria. You are not better than Thebes. Thebes had an enemy that brought her down. You were that enemy. But you have an enemy that's stronger than you, and that's the Lord. And he will bring you down. Your enemy is Yahweh, the Lord. Like most of the prophetic books in the Old Testament, if you're looking at Nahum in a modern translation, like the NIV, for instance, it'll be lined out like poetry, not written in paragraph form, like prose, because it's Hebrew poetry. Uh, if you remember, we talked a little earlier about Hebrew poetry and some of the other prophets. Hebrew poetry doesn't rhyme, never was meant to. And that's good for us because it would be lost in translation if it were uh, rhyming poetry. We wouldn't get the benefit of the beauty of it. But what Hebrew poets strove for was powerful imagery and the effective use of words. Wordplay was common in Old Testament poetry, and that includes Psalms and Proverbs, uh, as well as most of the prophets. In Nahum, for example, the opening verses of Nahum, each verse begins with the next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. There's an example of wordplay, of a poet exercising a gift, so that that would be easier to remember and also catch the attention of the reader. But also, the way that Nahum describes uh, the fall of Assyria in his prophecy uh, gives us insight into his effective use of the language too. Here's the way Nahum writes about the coming fall of Assyria and he's addressing it to its capital city. The capital city is Nineveh. You remember Nineveh from the Jonah story. A hundred years before, God had sent a message through Jonah to Nineveh, your days are numbered. Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. But you remember what happened. Nineveh repented and God relented. And Nineveh stood for that hundred years. Now, where are we? In Nahum's day, a new generation in Assyria has returned to the old patterns of brutality and godlessness and idolatry. And God has a, a message for the Nineveh of Nahum's day, just like he had a message for the Nineveh of Jonah's day. And the Nineveh of, of Nahum's day is headed for a fall. Listen to the way the poet Nahum delivers that message. An attacker advances against you, Nineveh. Guard the fortress, watch the road, brace yourselves, marshal all your strength. The shields of the soldiers are red. The warriors are clad in scarlet. The metal on the chariots flashes on the day they're made ready. The spears of the juniper are brandished. The chariots storm through the streets, rushing back and forth through the squares. They look like flaming torches. They dart about like lightning. The river gates are thrown open. The palace collapses. When Nahum wrote this, none of that had happened. But it's almost like a newsreel that he is showing to the people of Nineveh and of Assyria. This is what's going to happen. And it did. In fact, that last part, the river gates are thrown open, the palace collapses. Historians have discovered the ruins of Nineveh, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. And they determined, secular historians, determined that Nineveh fell when the enemy diverted the river that ran through its gates and flooded the city. And that made its defense so much harder that the city fell more easily than anyone thought that it could. Ne uh, Nahum said that before it happened. Back to his prophecy. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. The supply is endless, the wealth from all its treasures. She is pillaged, plundered, stripped. Hearts melt, knees give way, bodies tremble. Every face grows pale. Nineveh is used to 
seeing those kinds of things on the faces of the people they conquer. Nahum says, this will be you. All who hear the news about you will clap their hands at your fall. For who has not felt your endless cruelty? Some time ago, we talked a little bit about the boomerang effect of sin. Bible doesn't say what goes around comes around, but the Bible says in sin, that's much, uh, that, that's very often what happens. And the boomerang, a boomerang effect here for Nineveh is what you did to Thebes, somebody's going to do to you because they'll have the help of the Lord behind them. He's determined that your days are over. Nineveh, great city. Assyria, a great empire. No one had ever been their match before, but they were no match for God. This is a short book. It's only three chapters. But twice in this book, Nahum repeats this phrase, I am against you, says the Lord. I can't think of any words more terrible than that. I'm against you, says the Lord. Typically, over the course of history, cities rise and fall. That happens century after century, war after war, battle after battle. We know that. But Nahum had a special message for this city. He said, the Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh, you will have no descendants to bear your name. I will prepare your grave for you are vile, says the Lord. When great cities fall in battle, they remain great cities, don't they, typically? I mean, think about World War II. The cities that were the most populous and the most prosperous are still on the map. They, they're just under other control, perhaps, or they're cities that have been conquered and become a part of a new kingdom. And all through history, that was the case. Rome fell many times, but Rome's still there. Paris has fallen. It's still there. The great cities of the world tend to change owners sometimes. They certainly change their history, but the cities remain. Not Nineveh. Nineveh has disappeared from history. The Lord said, you'll have no descendants. And there is no city of Nineveh today. Archaeologists have discovered the ruins, but that was hard. It was, it was a long time. Uh, people were searching for Nineveh, had no idea. They knew the general area where it stood, but they couldn't find. They, it was so destroyed, they couldn't find the actual place where the city had once stood until they discovered it on the shores of the Tigris in Mesopotamia in the Middle East and have begun to excavate what little is left of Nineveh. The Lord said, I'll prepare your grave and bury you. And he did, under the sands of the Middle East. This is powerful prophecy. But remember, the role of the prophet is only partially prediction. It's mostly preaching. And so the book of Nahum is included here not primarily so that we would know what happened to Nineveh. The book of Nahum is included here so that we can ask questions about us and our relationship with the Lord and, and our future in his sight as well. There is a biblical truth, in other words, in all of these books, not just historical uh, accounts or not just prophecies of coming history, there is biblical truth. What's the biblical truth here? The book of Nahum, it seems to me, provides us with a great example to study a perplexing problem, and that problem is the wrath of God. The anger, the righteous anger of God. Chapter 1, verse 1 introduces Nahum. Here's chapter 1, verse 2. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. First words out of his mouth. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes 
and vents his wrath against his enemies. Is that your life verse? Anybody have that? You read that verse every morning to start your day? Somehow, I thought I had good Sunday school teachers, but they never really impressed that memory verse on me. I've never seen it cross-stitched and hanging on somebody's wall. That's not the kind of verse we're most comfortable with. We heard, what a, an amazing message today about all the ways that the Lord Jehovah provides for us in that psalm. And Nahum says, every word of it's true. But did I mention that the Lord is filled with wrath and the Lord takes vengeance on his enemies? Wow. Here it is in Scripture. And if you do a search for the wrath of God in a concordance, you'll find a lot of references to it. It's not just an occasional remark. It's a theme that runs through much of Scripture. Many of those Scriptures are in the Old Testament. And that has caused a lot of people to say, well, the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath. But thank goodness the God of the New Testament is a God of love. That's not true. That gives us two gods. That means at the very least God has changed. Uh, we can't say, thank goodness, we don't have God like he used to be. We have God like he is now. God doesn't change. I'm the Lord, I change not. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament, and the God of both Testaments is the God of today. The God we serve, the God we love, the God we heard preached about this morning is that same God. And wrath is a part of the nature of God for a reason. And scripture wants us to understand that, I think. Yes, there are a lot of places in the Old Testament where the wrath of God is mentioned. Moses said in Deuteronomy 9, talking to the Lord, I know this people have, have occasioned your wrath during the wilderness wanderings. And he was right. When they got into the promised land, Joshua found out that Achan, who stole those uh, treasures at the fall of Jericho when everything was supposed to go to the Lord, it brought down the wrath of God on the people of Israel. When Judah was taken into captivity, when Israel was taken into captivity, all the books say the wrath of God. He had reached his limit with his people. So, Old Testament verdict on God includes, it's not exclusively by any stretch, but it includes this wrath factor. And he is no different from the God of the New Testament. Now the Gnostics said he was. The Gnostics, remember, were that heretical group uh, in the early centuries of the church. They were the greatest challenge to the early church, the greatest threat to the early church, because they said they were Christian, but they had a heretical theology. And part of that theology was the God of the Old Testament is evil and the God of the New Testament is good. So we don't have the Old Testament. They had a Gnostic Bible that didn't have the Old Testament in it. Uh, we don't serve the God of the Old Testament. Uh, he's, he's the wrathful God. We serve the God of love in the New Testament. They turned the Old Testament on its head. All the villains in the Old Testament became their heroes because the villains of the Old Testament were against that God, and they said that God was evil. One of their heroes in the Old Testament was the snake in the Garden of Eden, because they said the snake was trying to warn Adam and Eve, don't listen to this evil God. Now that turns everything on its head, right? And we, uh, none of us would go that far. We wouldn't say, oh, my goodness, I'm, an, I'm a modern day Gnostic. There are no Gnostics today. But their influence is still around. And, and one of the places where uh, it's seen is that a Christian who wouldn't buy into the heresy of Gnosticism is still influenced, I think, 
by the, the perspective on the God of the Old Testament that makes them wary or uncomfortable around that God, as if the God of the New Testament is somehow different. <laughs> yeah, okay. Russell said, one girl said, that was before God became a Christian in the New Testament. That's a great lie. Of course that's not true. And one way we know that's not true is because the New Testament has passages about God's wrath, too. It absolutely does. Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. That's a New Testament passage. We just studied Revelation prior to our study of the Minor Prophets. What is Judgment Day? It's described in Scripture as for those who are not among the faithful, it's a day of God's wrath. It is, it is judgment on sin, and we'll come back to that, but that's a New Testament passage. Another way to disprove this is to look at all the passages in the Old Testament that are about love. I think about uh, Psalm 136. Psalm 136 is a liturgical psalm. It was written for use in worship. It's got 26 verses, and every single verse ends with, His love endures forever. There's a statement about God, and the people respond, His love endures forever. The leader makes a second statement about God, and the people respond, his love endures forever. 26 times in 26 verses, God's love is stressed. And it's, that could be multiplied many times through the Old Testament. We're not dealing with a bifurcation. We're not dealing with a separation between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New. So then how do we understand the God of wrath? Well, some would say... <clears throat> God is love and rumors of his wrath are greatly exaggerated. They would take the love passages and leave behind the rest. If we do that, we're violating scripture. We take it all. We can't say God's word is all of those parts of the Bible that I agree with or all of those parts of the Bible that I feel comfortable with. The Bible is God's word. And we get very upset, I think, when we hear people say otherwise. When we hear people say the Bible is just a book. The Bible is a, is a take it or leave it thing, a cafeteria of truth. You go down the line and you pick what you want to believe. And we say, no, no, that's not true. The Bible is the word of God. But then when we run into a rough passage... Our temptation is to put it aside just like it's something on that cafeteria line that's not for us. We need to embrace it all and say, I, I want to strive to understand this, but I believe it. God is all that he's presented to be in the scripture. And scripture says God is capable of wrath. There's another reason that this idea of God is love and let's forget about the wrath part is valid. And that's because scripture also says God is holy. What does that mean? It means he's pure, he's righteous, and that there's no sin in him. That there is no sin in anything that he associates with. He is holy. And he calls us out of sin. He calls us into holiness. But let's just focus on God for a second. If God is a God of righteousness and purity and holiness, then wouldn't he be angry at sin? Wouldn't he be angry at a Nineveh that had oppressed and subjected the rest of the Middle East to their iron rule? who had executed people, who had imprisoned people, who had enslaved people. And, and a God of holiness isn't upset by that, isn't concerned about that, and isn't planning to deal with that. We would say, yes, he is, because that's the kind of wrath we can get behind. That's the kind of wrath, that's the end of the movie where you want to see the bad guys get it, right? Well, that's 
the combination of God, a God of love and a God of holiness. That he, he can't be a holy God if he doesn't do something about all of the things that hurt people. He can't be a holy God if he doesn't act against, un, he can't be righteous if he doesn't act against unrighteousness. I'll put it that way. When we see people being hurt, when we see injustice, when we see cruelty, we experience righteous indignation. That's our favorite word, righteous indignation. It's wrath, it's, it's anger, but it's holy anger. We're wired that way. That's the reason, that's the reason at the end of the movie we wanna see the bad guys get it. Because we're wired that way. Our creator wired us that way. Because there will be a judgment day. Okay, so let's leave that option behind. We can't say God's a God of love and he is not a God of wrath. We, that option's not open to us. How about this one? We could go to the other extreme and say, you're right, God does hate sin, and therefore God hates everybody who sins. God hates sinners. And scripture says, no, he doesn't. Scripture says he loves sinners. If, if that theory is right, then scripture's wrong again. Because scripture clearly steers us in another direction. Romans 5. Romans 5 says, God didn't hate us when we were sinners. It says, while we were still sinners, God sent his son to die for us out of love. Last week in, um, in Micah, we were talking about forgiveness. I mentioned that God could have forgiven Judas. God could have forgiven Hitler. God could have forgiven Osama bin Laden if, if they had turned to him. Because God forgives sinners. That's what he does. That's his nature. And those were picked because of the magnitude of their sins. And yet God forgives them. And so uh, the idea that God is a God of wrath and because of that hates sinners is just as wrong as saying God's not a God of wrath. How about our recent study on Jonah? God forgave Nineveh, same city, same sins. God forgave them 100 years earlier under Jonah, but he's gonna judge them 100 years later, says Nahum. What's the difference? It's not a difference in God. It's a difference in Nineveh. Because when Jonah preached his message, Nineveh repented. And when Nineveh repented, God spared them. Under Nahum, there's no repentance. And Nineveh won't be spared. So we can't say God hates the sinner. He doesn't. Which brings us to the, what I think is the right answer. And you're going to say, well, I've heard this before. God hates sin, but God loves the sinner. There's where the wrath and love of God are in biblical balance. God hates sin, and he'll destroy it. God loves the sinner. He sent his son to die for us when we were still sinners. That's good theology. I heard a story, this is not biblical. I heard a story about a Quaker who late one night heard noise downstairs Quakers are pacifists, you know. They won't even act in self-defense. Heard a noise downstairs and realized somebody was in the house. So he came downstairs and confronted a burglar. And the Quaker was holding a shotgun. This is the story. The Quaker says to the burglar, son, I would not hurt thee for the world but thou art standing where I'm about to shoot. <laughs> okay, now how can I apply that story to the scripture? God's taking aim at sin. God's taking aim at sin, and he's gonna pull the trigger. What he's urging us to do is move away from it. He's judging sin. If we'll let go of sin, we won't be subject to judgment. Does that make sense? And so, so the wrath of God is not directed at the people that God created in his own image. He loves people. That's why sin hurts him so much. Uh, the, the, the reality is 
God is, and this has been his plan from the very beginning, God's going to eliminate sin. And if anybody refuses to let go of it, they're standing where he's about to shoot, for lack of a better way to describe it. It's not his will. And that's why he pleads with us to make a break with sin, to allow him to separate us from sin and to bring us, I'm not saying sinless perfection. I'm saying living lives where we are not outside of uh, the, the uh, salvation that God has provided for us on the cross. A salvation which has ready forgiveness when we still stumble at times. But I'm saying if we make a break with sin and, and, and form allegiance with God, then when God judges sin, we won't be in the crosshairs. And that's what the wrath of God is aiming at. Um, Phil Yancey has a, a great working definition of sin. Uh, uh, he said to him, sin is, a, is like a carcinogen. It's a cancer causer. And, and sin in our souls does what cancer can do in our bodies. God loves us, so he hates the cancer. God loves us, so he hates the sin that's doing that in your soul and my soul unless we have a divine remedy for it. And God will deal with that cancer of sin. We can have spiritual healing. God often heals physically. God always heals spiritually if we ask him. We can have spiritual healing and we can be free from that if you and I will trust him. In other words, shorthand, sin destroys people. God loves people. Therefore, God's going to destroy sin. But if any don't let go of their sin, you can finish that sentence. Uh, there's the passage in Matthew where Jesus talks about the sheep and the goats. Uh, he talks about separating one from the other, right hand and left hand. He talks about their destiny. He come to a place I've prepared for you, he says to the ones on his right. But to the ones on his left who are not his, he says, your destiny is a place prepared for the devil and his angels. You see what he didn't say? He didn't say it was prepared for them. He didn't say that his intention all along was that people would go to hell. God's intention was that all should be saved. And scripture says that. God's not willing that any should perish. So if anyone won't let go of sin, they're going to a place God never intended them to go. They're going to a place prepared for the devil and his angels. I keep coming back to those two moral attributes of God. God is love and God is holiness. Because he is love, then he doesn't cut us off at our first or second or third failure. He's a loving and patient God. But because he is holy, then he doesn't just wink at sin. And he doesn't just say, I wish they wouldn't, but they do. And so like a doting grandfather, maybe. What am I going to do? Boys will be boys, you know. God's not that figure. Because God is a perfect combination of holiness and love. Nahum says in chapter 1, God is slow to anger, but he will punish sin. There is grace in that slow to anger part. There is judgment in the punishment that eventually comes. No, this isn't our favorite passage of scripture. And we're not going to hang it on the wall, I bet. But it's true. We serve a God who loves us and hates sin. So we need to be as far away from sin as we can get with his help. Let's pray together. Lord, you are our life. All we are and all we will be is in you. Help us so to live that not only will we find in you that separation from all that you hate and will one day destroy, 
but may we be examples to others who are looking for that way and who need to find that point of separation so that their eternal experience will be a God of love. In Jesus' name, amen.